Welcome to the first lecture video for Chapter 8, where we're going to talk about momentum, what that quantity is, and when it is used in problem solving. So in this first video, we're going to introduce the ideas of what momentum is and what we mean by the word impulse. So first of all, we define momentum as mass times velocity, and textbooks all across the world use P as the letter to represent momentum, and momentum doesn't have the letter P in it, and so one of the things that we're going to do all throughout um, this chapter is rather than relying on that as a new quantity, we're just going to talk about masses and velocities multiplied together, and that idea is what we mean by momentum. Now, momentum is a vector because velocity itself is a vector. Whatever way the velocity is pointing, or if we're going east or we're going up or whatever we want to call the direction, that will be the direction that momentum is going. And so thinking about masses and velocities are really all we need to do in this chapter for this new quantity. And the units themselves for momentum are just kilograms times meters per second, which meet, uh, mass is in kilograms and velocity is in meters per second. And so there's no new units to introduce in this chapter either. And so often we will just write the word momentum if we're talking about it, or just think about the quantity m times v. Okay, so what does momentum really mean? The simple version is that it's, it's telling us how hard it is to stop an object. If we imagine, for example, a big elephant that's just kind of like slowly lumbering towards us, it's still going to be hard for us to push on that elephant and stop it from moving because it has a huge amount of mass, even if it's not going very quickly. On the other hand, if we have something like a bullet heading towards us, it is very hard to stop that. Magicians can do it. It's very hard to stop that, but that's because it's, although a small mass, moving at incredibly high velocities. So those two different factors can make it hard for us to stop an object or hard to get something to start moving if it's not yet moving. And that's really the way that we want to think about this, is how difficult is it to change the velocity of an object given the fact that mass matters to us. Now, what we're going to see in the first portion of chapter 8 is that a lot of the ways that we can think of momentum and the small problems that we can do early on in the chapter could also be solved using Newton's laws of motion. So Newton's second law of motion is that net force is equal to mass times the acceleration. And I want us to understand that that is equivalent to this new thing on our slide here, that net force is equal to the change in momentum over the change in time. So let's think about this briefly. If we write out F net equals MA, so I'm going to write that on the um, whiteboard. So F net equals MA. Okay. And if we remember that acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time, then we might start to see that mass times the change in velocity, so let's get a color to circle this so we can see it a little bit better. This top part, mass times the change in velocity, if the mass isn't changing from the start of the problem to the end of it, then that top part is the um, change in momentum. And so what we end up with then, if we replace that top part, m delta v, with the change in momentum, then the bottom part is the change in time, change in time, then we get what we have on the slide here. And so on the slide itself, I put that going around backwards. So um, I started with F net equals MA and showed how it matches our slide. The slide that we can always look back at if we um, didn't get a chance to see the whiteboard shows it the other way around. So the way, the, the point at which these two are completely identical is if the mass is the same at the beginning of the problem and the end of the problem. And for physics 125, all of the problems that we do, that will be the case. In the last 
lecture video for this chapter, we will be talking very briefly about rockets. And rockets are situations where the mass is changing as the rocket launches because it is um, sending out mass through all of that fuel that's being burned. So it is losing mass in order to be able to change its velocity. And we'll be talking about that at the very end of the chapter. Now, if we go back to the whiteboard, if we go back to the whiteboard and now we go back to, let's erase some of the in-between parts. So I'm going to er erase the mass times acceleration part. And I'm going to erase the delta P because we don't really like that all that much. If we look, on both sides we can multiply by the change in time, delta T. And I'm going to do that in, let's go with pink. Let's see how well pink goes. So I'm going to multiply by delta T. I'm going to multiply by delta t, and we see that on the side here, the delta t's cancel out. So on the bottom and on the top, they go away. And then the starting point, f net equals delta, uh, f net times delta t equals m delta v, is functionally what is on our slide as well. So. I'm not going to I'm not going to write out on the whiteboard what's already on our slide cuz the slide is much easier to read. But net force and total force mean the same thing. And then mv final minus mv initial is just taking that idea of the change in velocity and writing out in um in a more complete way that it's the final velocity minus the initial velocity. But both of those terms have to be multiplied by m. Now the quantity on the left of this equation here has a special name in the textbook. It is, it is referred to as impulse. So the net force times the change in time tells us how we are able to speed up or slow down an object, how we're able to change this motion based on the mass of that object. And so the impulse is really telling us about the stopping ability of the force that we're applying. We will be able to stop something if we apply a bigger force on it. We will be able to stop something better if we apply that force for a longer period of time. It is also the case, though, just as we saw in the previous slide, that any question that we could ask you that is intending to use this tool could also be answered using F net equals MA. And that's okay. They are equivalent, um, equivalent ideas. Now the textbook talks about this um, equation on the slide as if it's some magical brand new thing and they call it the impulse momentum equation. But really all it's telling us is that the idea of impulse as a concept is the same thing as the change in momentum of an object. So however we wanna handle that in our, um, in our notes and in our heads, we just wanna make sure we understand that if we see the word impulse, we know what it means but we've been working with forces for several chapters now. We've been working with velocities since chapter two. None of the stuff on this slide is particularly brand new to us. And since we don't have to memorize equations, they're given to us, we really have what we need in order to continue here. Now, the big thing about this chapter is that the reason that we introduce momentum is because when things hit each other, momentum is going to be conserved. And we'll talk about that, we'll prove it to ourselves and make sure we understand that um, in the upcoming slides. But one thing to be aware of is that in collision, collisions, the forces between colliding objects are not constant in most cases. If we look at this simple animation of a bouncing ball, it's highly exaggerated, but what we see is that the ball squishes when it gets to the ground and then unsquishes when it comes back out again. That's really similar to the way that we thought about springs, the fact that the force is not constant as we stretch that spring bigger and bigger and bigger. But it's a similar idea, not the same um, as that situation. And if we went into the details of what actually happens when we have a collision, so on the slide here, the picture is someone kicking some ballistics gel and allowing us to trace how the force is changing as the um, foot initially hits that at T1, pushes in, and then the kick comes back out again and 
stops having contact at T2. The maximum force on an object in a collision is roughly twice the average or effective force. We don't have to memorize that idea, but it's something to be aware of that the force is not constant during the collision. So you'll often see us talk about the average force during the collision, and that's why. Because our equations can talk about what happens with the average force. It cannot handle that um, changing force without calculus, and we don't have that here. But we don't need the details in order to answer real-world questions or to get to the most important results of the chapter, which is good news for us. Okay, so a question for us to think about using this new equation. And as with a lot of these introductory questions, every time that we come up with a new equation, we normally try to have a, an example or two that we can use to practice what this equation looks like in use. So what I'd like you to do is to pause the video and try this one on your own, and then we will go through it together on the whiteboard. So. Pause the video, but even if you don't, I'm going to take some time to write it up on the whiteboard. So we draw a picture. We have our initial velocity arrow and our final velocity arrow. We have that the mass is 0 0.15 kilograms. We have that the initial velocity if we look at the picture here on the slide and on what you're going to see me have, the initial velocity is to the left. So that would mean we have to include that negative sign. If we didn't, hopefully we pause the video, if we didn't include that negative sign, that's going to be something you want to put in all capital letters in your notes. Highlight it if you need to, but one of the most common ways that students make mistakes in Chapter 8 is by not paying attention to the direction of vectors. We need to remember that we've been working with vectors for quite a long time now. We had a brief break in Chapter 7. We need to not forget that direction has meaning in physics, and it's a very important um, distinction. The final velocity is to the right, so it's going to be positive. And then the change in time, the elapsed time, is 2 milliseconds. which when we look up what a millisecond is, we say there's 10 to the 3 milliseconds in a second, or 1 millisecond is 1 to the, or 10 to the minus 3 seconds. And so our time is going to be 0 0.002 seconds. Okay. So far, what we should have should look something like this. Okay. All we've done so far is just to set up the picture, the given information. But now we have the tool on our slide, and we recognize that a couple of things are important to notice here. First of all, with mass by itself, and then these three things, final velocity, initial velocity, and the change in time, we realized that we could get the acceleration and then do mass times acceleration to get the force. You can even try that on your own just to verify it for yourself. We could handle this problem back in chapter four. And we actually have done problems like this back in chapter four when we had a basketball against the wall we solved for the acceleration, but we could have just as easily solved for the force by just multiplying it by the mass. So the next step here is to write down that equation and then plug in the numbers. So we'll do that next. Okay, so the equation is that the net force times the change in time or the elapsed time is equal to mv final minus mv initial. So we're looking for the net force. We multiply 0 0.002 on the left side. And then we plug in all of this stuff where we keep in mind that negative sign that showed up. Okay, so so far I haven't plugged anything into the calculator yet, but I've written out all of the things. things. 
All right. And now the whole right side can be plugged into the calculator. And we get 7.5. So the net force, 7.5 on the right, will divide by 0 0.002 on both sides. And we get 37.50 newtons. 3,750 newtons. Okay. So that's the average force of the bat on the ball. And again, average force because it is not a constant force during that whole bounce off of the bat. The other thing to think about is the fact that that amount of time where they're in contact has to come from the fact that the baseball is actually being forced to stop in a certain amount of distance and then start back up again in um, a certain amount of distance. We will put together a digital handout showing us through chapter two equations that that two millisecond time does in fact make, um, make sense to us. If we look at how much a baseball is able to compress, uh, and this is a picture of a baseball in the process of being hit against a bat, as well as a picture of a baseball being tested in a facility that can just um, apply a certain amount of force to see how much it gets squished. That digital handout will kind of show us where that two milliseconds comes from and reminds us that when we think about forces and a changing velocity and all this sort of thing, We've been building on our understanding from chapter to chapter. We talked about changes to velocity back in chapter two. We talked about forces in chapter four, and we have all of that understanding that we can go back to and rely on. Throughout the chapter, we will see several different examples of sports collisions. And again, the force isn't constant during the collision, whether it's a baseball being hit, a golf ball being um, hit with a club or a tennis ball being hit with a racket, although the force is not constant during that time, we can still handle the collision with the average force and our tools from this chapter. Okay, the other thing that we want to talk about in this introductory video is just making sure that we understand why we can use one of the most important tools for the remaining part of the chapter, why we can use that tool based on just thinking about Newton's third law, that equal forces, um, that for every force there's an equal and opposite force. So let's imagine that we are looking, for this picture on our slide, we are looking at two masses, like maybe hockey pucks, that come together and hit each other on a table and then bounce apart. You are watching all of this happen from above, so we're not worrying about gravity because gravity and normal force just kind of balance out. They're just going to hit each other sideways and then bounce off again. And the key part is not the before or the after. The key part is actually during the collision itself. When the two pucks are actively touching each other, they are touching each other for the same amount of time, and the force from puck number two on puck number one is equal and opposite to the force of puck number one on puck number two. So the key thing is that when we look at F net times delta T for the first object, that amount of change to mass one's momentum is the same total amount in the opposite direction to the net force on object two times delta T, so the change in momentum of mass number two. What that means is that the amount of momentum that mass one might lose or gain is equal to the amount of momentum that mass two might gain or lose. The overall system then has the same amount of momentum at the beginning that it does at the end. Often we go through this uh, more quantitatively on the board, um, and we may or may not have a handout that goes through those steps. But we've talked about the key ideas here. If a collision happens quickly enough, 
that the primary force, the net force, is effectively the force of them hitting each other, then the change in momentum of object one is opposite to the change in momentum of object two. The total change is zero, and so momentum is conserved. In other words, momentum before is equal to momentum after. So if we look at the equation that's on our slide here, m1 v1 initial is the amount of momentum in object one. m2 v2 initial is the amount of momentum in object two at the beginning. And then on the right side, we have the amount of momentum for object one at the end, the amount of momentum for object two at the end. And in equation form, there's lots of different ways we could see this. The textbook for this chapter and this chapter only uses a whole bunch of notation that is completely unnecessary to us and makes it seem more complex and more um, abstracted from what we've been working with in the previous chapters. The way the textbook talks about this is before uses P for momentum without a prime and after uses P for momentum with a prime. It looks totally different than anything before this chapter or after it. And so we are not going to match the textbook in this chapter quite as closely as we do in other chapters. We'll try to use the um, O for initial and F for final the way that we have been through the rest of the semester and the rest of the chapters in the book. And continuing to try to rephrase the same equation in multiple ways, at the bottom here, the middle bottom, we kind of write out in words mass one, velocity one before the collision, plus mass two, velocity two before the collision, is equal to mass one, velocity one after the collision, plus mass two, velocity two after the collision. Lots of words, but it's trying to describe the equation right above it, the one that we're going to be using. The most important thing I can make sure to point out to us is that these things are vector quantities, so we have to watch for the signs, the plus and minus signs when they come up, and towards the end of the chapter, one of the last things we'll introduce and practice with is that we can have collisions happening where we have to worry about x and y vectors, um, x and y components of the velocities, in the same way that we have in other chapters, but we'll be able to handle that too when it comes up. So in the next video, we will introduce a bunch of example problems. We'll introduce one, um, one additional problem type in the next video that has to do with thinking about energy and momentum in the same kind of problem. And then in the later lecture videos, we'll be talking about additional collision types that we can um, problem solve with and think about. So I'll see you in the next one.